Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here. I must say I love a captive audience. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, I am really privileged to be here, but before I start my conversation, I do want to make one quick acknowledgement that today is the birthday of Florence Nightingale, and it is celebrated as national, actually International Nurses Day the world over. So the Lady of the Lamp, the modern day ladies of the lamp who, and I say that gender not specific, um, the people whose caring and compassion and advocacy continues to shine the light into the dark places of the world. I want to really take a moment to acknowledge the nurses in the room, so thank you. I spoke to a group this large, it was a group of attorneys, um, the Rhode Island Bar Association, but this is, I think, the second largest or the largest group of people I've spoken to, so it's very exciting to be up here. I want to talk to you about my passion. I was not going to tell you many stories because I know our time is precious. I have a little bit of time, but speaking quickly with Dr. Caros outside, um, I need to tell you the reason that I'm up here. I was a third year medical student. I had a patient. Um, I was planning to do obstetrics. I loved OBGYN. I loved bringing new lives into the world. And so I was up doing my obligatory oncologic rotation in gynecology when I met the woman who called me to my calling in life. Her name was Mrs. Cruz. She was a woman in her 50s who actually at this point, I don't recall the kind of cancer that she had, but it was everywhere. Cannonballs in the lungs, and she was a human skeleton. And she came into the hospital for quote unquote pain management in the 90s. And of course in the 90s you came into the hospital and you could actually stay there indefinitely, right? So she was put where all dying patients get put, in the room at the end of the hall. Where nobody else wants to go, where nobody wants to acknowledge that quote unquote there's nothing more that we can do here. And as a medical student on the floor at the time, I had the time to go in and, and speak with her. And she taught me what dying really was about. She taught me how her disease had robbed her of her profession, how her husband had left her as the medical bills mounted and the stress mounted, how her grandchildren were afraid of her because she had been transformed from this jolly round person into this human skeleton. And I kept going back to her room because I had this unbelievable gnawing sensation that she had something very, very important that she needed to teach me. I kept showing up as she got weaker and weaker and lay in her bed. And I did wonder at times what exactly we were doing for her. But I was the third year medical student, so I shut up and I rounded and I kept going back. And one afternoon, I was in her room and she began to cough, and she began to cough up blood, a little blood at first, and then quarts of blood. So I did what every good third year medical student knows how to do, which is panic, <laughs> and run for the nurse. <laughs> help, help, help. Finally found a nurse to come back in the room with me, and she was taking her last breaths. And as she was taking her last breaths, she looked up to the corner of the room and she held up her arms and she was gone. And I was so upset that I hadn't been able to be there for my friend as she was dying. But I didn't know she was dying. I didn't know this was going to happen. And to this day, I don't know if she knew that it was going to happen. So to the honor of Mrs. Cruz and the death that she died, I am here today to tell you that I am on a campaign so that every dying person in America knows that it's happening and knows their choices, and you guys are going to help me with that. So what is this stuff that I do, palliative care? I think the simplest way to say it is that it is medical care for people who are seriously ill. Can you all hear me? Am I okay? All right. Um, that's really all that it is. You don't have to be dying. You don't have to be comfort measures only. And if I teach you one thing, I hope I teach you that this is not just a euphemism for hospice. Because palliative care is way, way more than end-of-life care. 
Um, and what is really important is that palliative care at its best works with the existing healthcare team for these patients who needless to say are hard to take care of, right? They're not your patients with tonsillitis who come in on one medication and are healthy and that's all there is to it. They're usually on 100 medications. They've been in the hospital 14 times. They've got 19 specialists. These are patients that often take a team approach for us to wrap our arms around. And that is what palliative care seeks to do. The serious illness continuum. I wish it happened this way, but right now it doesn't. I don't know if you guys can see. Go over to the very edge of the screen where, you, where the dark blue line and the light blue line meet and it says diagnosis. The way this is supposed to work is that at diagnosis of a serious illness, doesn't matter what it is, dementia, cancer, COPD, chronic renal insufficiency, you guys pick the disease, I'm good, whatever, you meet me or you meet your primary care doctor who's also going to do your palliative care because I think that's a really important thing for you all to be thinking about. And at the beginning, it's your oncologist who may be doing more of the talking. Oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this PET scan, we're going to do this chemo, we're going to do this. And all I have to say is, hi, how are you? I'm Jenny Ritz, I'm going to be your palliative care doctor. Any questions right now? But then, as things move forward, we go forward together. And as treatment is done and fails, and as diseases progress, palliative care assumes more and more of a role. Until at some point, you guys see at the very top corner there, it's all light blue, right? It's all palliative, it's all comfort focused. Does anybody know what that time of life is called? Hospice, that's hospice. And then I wanna call your attention to a really important part of the curve. You see that red triangle? Death and bereavement. Oh, my patients don't need hospice. I know all about symptom management. I can do this. Do you all follow your bereaved patients families for 13 months after the death and provide ongoing support, making sure that they are on your bereavement services at the anniversary of the death so that these families get the proper support? Because if you're doing that, then you guys are doing hospice. But my guess is you probably aren't doing that. The reason that this is confusing, and I'll try to talk to this side of the room too, is because <laughs> People think, about people think about palliative care way over there at the end in the light blue. Oh God, we need palliative. No, you guys needed palliative five or six or eight months before. What you need when everything is comfort and we can't fix this anymore is hospice care. And then people say, oh, but when, when you call hospice care, they just die, right? They die within hours of hospice care showing up. Well, that's because hospice gets called right about where the red and the light blue intersect, right? These patients were dying long before we walked into the room and we are now in crisis management. So what we somehow have to do as a team is move this entire conversation upstream a little bit. That's absolutely what we have to do. Oh, there's a slide thing down there. Um, so, so, <laughs> so what do we do? What is that light blue part of the curve? We do symptom management. So as people are getting their chemotherapy, I'm helping manage the neuropathic pain from their chemo. As patients are visiting with their pulmonologist, I'm trying to talk to them about not when they get their next pneumonia and end up in the hospital in the ICU, but what do they want to do about it? Do they really want to be intubated? Those are goals for care discussion, as I call them, with teeth, right? It's not just a bunch of check marks. It's patient specific, it's disease specific, and it's what really makes a difference for these families so that they don't have the Mrs. Cruz experience. We do advanced directives, we fill out most forms, we do those kinds of things because we all know that when this falls apart, it doesn't fall apart during office hours when the nurse navigator is there. It's two o'clock in the morning and there's a covering doctor and it always goes wrong then, right? We deliver serious news. Um, that is something that my colleagues um, in, as physicians have a really hard time doing. We all are very hopeful and we want what's best for our patients and sometimes it's very hard to sit down and say these hard things of I can't make this disease go magically away. We also address emotional and spiritual concerns. As I said, these are the sickest people in the community and it's very easy to become the lady with dementia, chronic renal insufficiency, COPD and diastolic heart failure rather than Mary who made the winning blueberry pie for the 1936 Rhode Island State Fair, Mary who raised nine children in a Catholic faith. And bringing some of that humanity back into healthcare is deeply what palliative care is about. 
We assist with prognostication. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the hospital and patients who are darkly mottled and breathing agonally are being wheeled down for their CAT scan. And I'm like, um, folks, hello, um, this person's dying, like taking their last breaths. But we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to say this person's got years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes. Because if patients and families know that, they make very different choices about how they're going to spend the rest of that time. And we assist in transitions and care. We know what that wild world of the outpatient setting is outside of physicians' offices and outside of hospitals. That strange gray world of skilled care, rehab, long-term care, home care, hospice, what the heck is that mess? Patients and families need our help in navigating this because many healthcare professionals don't really know what that world is like and, and can be of help in, in patients and families' lives. I'm not going to bore you with this, but palliative care has been out there for long enough that we really have some astonishing quality data on our side. Improved quality of life, improved patient and team satisfaction. When we can have honest conversations and get everybody on the same page, everybody, even the other physicians and nurses who may not have wanted to have these conversations, feels a lot better. It's like we've suddenly started to talk about the 9,000 pound elephant in the room. Improved caregiver distress. This is hard for caregivers. And when caregivers understand weeks, not years, hours, not days, they feel better because that's realistic hope. Those are realistic things that they can work on. Um, improved symptom burden? I hope so. That's what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Helping with pain and those kind of things. Um, increase in advanced care planning, and this is interesting, and I want to call your attention to Dr. Jennifer Temmel's article in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2010. Patients who get palliative care live longer than patients who don't. Probably it's because we keep them out of the hospital. Hospitals are not friendly places for patients who are seriously ill. Their meds get changed, they get delirious, they fall out of bed, they break their hip, they get C. diff, right? If we can keep them home, they live longer. And I also want to um, put a tiny side pitch in. Dr. Temmel is giving grand rounds at Rhode Island Hospital this coming Tuesday at 8 o'clock, integrating palliative care and oncologic care. And everybody is welcome, George Auditorium or the Miriam Hospital or Newport, if anybody can come and listen to her speak. Um, she's the invited Stanley Aronson Hospice and Palliative Medicine professor coming on Tuesday. So come and hear her if you're interested. I don't wake up in the morning and do a little jig because I, in fact, do save the healthcare system a lot of money, but I do. It's not why I get up and put on my shoes every morning and head out the door, but I think especially in speaking to an ACO, it's really important to realize that this actually is incredibly cost effective. We have really good medicine for early stage disease, even stage two and three disease. But it is these seriously ill adults who are in the last 18 to 24 months of their life that we really struggle with. When is enough enough? When do we stop? What do we do? And it is these tier 3A, the big spenders, if you will, that cost us the vast majority of our Medicare dollars. 5% of the population, 50% of the cost. And although it's not well, how we as healthcare professionals like to think about it, this is something we've got to get our handle on because if we can use that money to actually make people better in other places, childhood immunizations, et cetera, then we've done a really good thing. We have really good hospice and we have really good bereavement support after hospice, but it is this population that we seek to serve that really is um, something that we can help with in terms of cost. To be of value today, you all hear this word probably, the way that the um, healthcare system today defines value is high quality and lower cost. So if I had to ask you, you know, does palliative care have a place at the table in the future, I think overwhelmingly people would say yes, it absolutely does. We are bringing all kinds of corrections, if you will, back to our broken healthcare system. And so you say, okay, well this is great. How come patients and families are not just knocking our doors down? Why aren't physicians calling us and saying, see these patients and see these patients? Don't freak out, it's just to save the date. <laughs> Ultimately, this is about death and dying, right? It's not sexy. It's not sexy. But it's something that is deeply human, and we've got to get better about talking about it, or we're not going to be able to serve these patients. What are the barriers? 
I, I see them every single day. Patients. Our patients have about an eighth grade education. Sitting with one of my patients at, at the um, emergency room at the hospital, this 70-year-old son asks me why in the world I'm not going to offer his 95-year-old demented mother a brain transplant. Okay, we have to sort of go back to step one. Modern medicine has coughed up so darn many miracles that people just assume that we're going to go on forever and ever and ever. Think about daytime drama. Have you guys watched the daytime soaps? Medical coma lasts eight days. People wake up at the commercial break. Their makeup is perfect. There's no bed sores. <laughs> perfect. This is great. And we wonder why they don't understand what CPR is really like and what being in an ICU is really like. That's what they're hearing, folks, because we're not telling them about it. Providers. I have met the enemy, and she is me. We are dead lousy at this. We really are dead lousy at this. Um, I'm going to go to Blue Cross today and talk to them about an article that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association talking about how well, and I use that in quotation marks, we do with talking to our patients about their serious illness. That 81% of patients with metastatic colon cancer do not realize that the chemo that they're receiving, sometimes fifth, sixth, seventh line chemotherapy, is not going to cure their disease. That 76 of patients who are on hemodialysis don't know that they can stop dialysis at any time and what that death would look like if in fact their suffering is unbelievable. We are not having these conversations in real and meaningful ways that our patients can understand us. And so we think that our patients are making informed choices, but really what we're doing is making choices of what the doctor thinks is the right thing to do. And we've got to grow up about that. Our healthcare system, as I think I don't have to tell anybody, is broken. The money is not in keeping a nice hospice aid or a home health aid to care for our demented patients at home and keep them out of the emergency room. So instead of spending, $900, $1,000 a month to put a home health aid in somebody's home. We spend $30,000 on chemo and send them to the emergency room where $100,000 gets spent in the next hospitalization. It's backwards. And happily, I think some of the movements from ACOs are transforming this. But it is broken, folks. And I think that we can continue to be a part of realigning care to what we know to be the right and best thing for our patients and families. Providers, I got everybody. My, this is my Jersey Turnpike analogy. For those of you who have heard it, I apologize. But it's really, I think, an important thing that we need to understand. When you get diagnosed with a serious illness, it is like entering the Jersey Turnpike, Delaware Bridge. It's really not too bad right at the very beginning. You've got beautiful scenery. There's not a whole lot of traffic. The tolls are few and far between, and they're not that expensive. Perfect. But we all know where this is going, right? We all know where this is going. And I think what's really important to realize is that for some patients, with full understanding, we are going all the way to Times Square, folks, to a death of futility in an ICU where we have done everything possible, and that's that. And we're going to withdraw support, and they are going to die right there in Times Square. And if a patient has gotten all the way to Times Square and that is really what they want and really is consistent with their wishes, then we have done exactly the right thing. But if they never really wanted to get to Times Square and wanted instead to stop before the belching toxic smog of Elizabeth, New Jersey, <laughs> then maybe we haven't quite done what we needed to do. And because if they get to that Holland Tunnel, folks, they're in Manhattan. And there ain't no going back. And what we've got to be better about is where are we on this turnpike and what are the upcoming attractions and what is important to the person who's actually driving this car, the patient that you are sitting with. Where do they want to go? So palliative care as a navigator, dog as my co-pilot, right? And really importantly, at every rest station along the Jersey Turnpike, is my hospice team. 
so that at, when I decide with this patient and family, you know, exit nine, here's what we got here, and up ahead is this, this, and this, and the patient says, you know, I don't think I need to get to exit nine. We pull over, and I get out and hand them to that person who settles them in, gets them a Dunkin' Donuts, takes them to the Sabaro, settles them in for their Motel 6 for the night, right? But it is deeply about driving this bus and helping our patients and families drive this bus in a way that is meaningful to them. So we've got to be better navigators. There is no easy way to tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. <laughs> Why is this funny? It's not really funny, right? We ought to be able to be the someone who can. Palliative care has traditionally been the ones who have the guts to say, um, guess what, guys? The whiskey is not working anymore. But I think what's really important for you all to hear is that your patients would rather you all be the someone who can. They don't really want to come and see me. Not that I'm not nice and I can be funny at times, but really they want their own doctor. They want their own nurse practitioner, their own case manager to say, George, things aren't going so well, right? And I think that what's important to realize is that the word value has two meanings. I talked to you about quality and cost and all the healthcare gobbledygook. But value also is what is important? What is important? One of our patients at Newport Hospital we had the privilege of taking care of. His oncologist is rather unrealistic, shall I just say. And he was admitted with um, liver function tests in the 4,000s, cancer everywhere, and septic. Oh, and also renal failure. And his oncologist said, oh, you need to stay. You need to get hydrated. I'm sure there's something more we can try. My nurse practitioner, Kate, went into his room and sat down with him and said, what is important to you? And it was getting home to his pug to be able to go home and see his dog. So the plan was for him to get out of there with hospice that afternoon. But the oncologist came back and said, you can't let me down. You can't throw in the towel. You have to stay. And that's powerful. So that patient changed his mind, and he died in the hospital on Monday morning without services, without hospice, and without getting home to his pug. Times Square, folks. And we had even tried to get him off the highway. It happens every single day. And we have to do better. What is important to this patient? What is this next hospitalization, this CAT scan, this stress test, this whatever, this new drug, whatever? What are you hoping to accomplish? And if it really is going to make a difference for this patient clinically, functionally, cognitively, great. But if you're just trying to fit a square peg in a round hole over and over again, then take a deep breath and say, wait a second. What is it exactly that I am hoping to accomplish? And that's a different kind of value than quality over cost. But it's a really important one. Overwhelming evidence that when we can talk to our patients in ways that they understand and feel supported as human beings, um, we do better. We do better. I don't know if you all have heard about the unbelievable epidemic of physician burnout that is truly a national health crisis. It's because we've become widgets, right? EMR filler outers and insurance adjusters and this and that and the other thing. These kinds of conversations, one or two a week, are the biggest antidote to burnout because you make such a difference. Anthony Bach wrote a book called Balancing Honesty and Hope, Communication in Serious Illness. It's my Bible. It's one of those things you go back to time and time again and you learn new things. And he said, suboptimal communication creates a vicious spiral that makes us feel more like hamsters on a wheel than healers. When we have the right conversation skills, we can move patients and families. And when I say move, I mean not only move them emotionally and spiritually, I mean move them toward the care that we know is the right thing for them. And it's centered around what is important. What do they really understand? I have yet to meet a patient who says to me, yeah, I'm all ready. I'd love to, I'd love to die today. Most patients say, I want to do everything. I want to keep living. 
And as much as I'd love for that to happen for all of my patients, as best I can tell, I can't promise anybody immortality. So it's a matter of figuring out what are the things that make their life worth living and how can we focus on those and how can we accomplish those and how can we make sure that they understand that Elizabethtown's coming and do you really want to go there or shall we settle in here at the Motel 6? Primary palliative care. What is the most important thing to you? Be honest, it doesn't have to be super gloom and doom. I'm really worried about how sick you are. It seems like things aren't going that well right now. Basic stuff, advanced care planning, again, from you. You guys know what block roadblocks are coming up for this patient. For a dementia patient, it's going to be not being able to eat and swallow. For a COPD patient, they're going back to the hospital with a pneumonia. For a cancer patient, you guys know. You all know this. Help get them down on paper so that they can actually have choices consistent with who they are. And basic symptom management. Patients trust you when you can take away their pain, when you can make their breathing easier, when you can control their nausea, and when you can talk to them honestly about the scary, scary changes that are sweeping their world when they are living with these illnesses. It's really pretty simple. As a result of a failure to prognosticate, let alone prognosticate accurately, patients may die deaths they deplore in locations that they despise. From the um, Emergency Medical Journal. We think somehow that prolonging life is a win, but when you prolong life to keep somebody in a nursing home on a feeding tube with zero quality of life, you may not have done anybody any favors. And sometimes death is not the worst thing. Interestingly, it's exactly backwards from the way our healthcare system is. When you ask older adults, what is the most important thing to you? And this was done, by the way, by the Center for the Advancement of Palliative Care because of the death panel press that we got from Sarah Palin and company. So we wanted to show people this is not what this is about. So elders were asked to rank. What's, what's the answer, folks? What do they choose? Maintaining independence overwhelmingly. 76% don't want somebody wiping their behind and to spend the rest of their life in a nursing home and be a burden to their families. But our healthcare system is designed to do just the opposite, right? Prolong life at all cost, no matter that the disability comes. This is not withholding or rationing care. This is aligning care to preferences and adding value. So what would you want? if time is short, to be able to get away, take your kids to Disney? Would you choose something different for you than you're recommending to your patients? You know, doctors, most of us don't want to do chemo. Overwhelmingly, physicians aren't going to do chemo treatments, if you ask them. We need to do better and be more honest. And when we wait until the last minute, like Mrs. Cruz, we rob our patients of time that they could spend doing things that actually matter to them. Support, dignity, privacy, help for your family, best symptom management possible. Do our patients and families deserve anything less than that? And I want to introduce you to my hero. Her name is Diane Meyer. And for people who don't know her, she's a class act. I've had the privilege of meeting her and working with her a couple of different times. She actually lives in New York, so I don't think she'd like my New Jersey turnpike analogy, but oh well. Oh, sorry. Um, she's actually a geriatrician, which is near and dear to my heart because that's how I started this career. Um, and she actually has written extensively about this problem. Um, and then in the Journal of Health Affairs, she wrote a thing that actually I think is in your packets. I hope it is. But I'm going to take just a second to read it to you because she says it a lot better than I can. Patients and families, especially those dealing with a progressive cancer, in this case, illness, know that every life ends in death. They assume that their doctors are trained and knowledgeable about end of life as well. And they assume that if the doctor recommends more tests and treatments, he thinks they will help in some way. Patients and families also assume that their doctors will tell them when time is running out what to expect and how best to navigate these unknown and frightening waters. But many doctors don't do these things. Most are, in fact, completely untrained 
in these aspects of the human experience. Medical school and residency have traditionally provided little or no training on how to care for these patients when disease-modifying treatments no longer work. Physicians are trained to make diagnoses and to treat disease. Untrained in skills such as pain and symptom management, expert communication about what to expect for the future, and achievable goals for care, physicians do what we have been trained to do. Order more tests, more procedures, more treatments, even when these things no longer help, and even when these things no longer make sense. We are going to do better. We are going to do better together, and we are going to transform serious illness for coastal patients, patients in Rhode Island, and patients in the whole country, and we are going to do it together. Thank you very much for your attention.